Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Donna Marente. She is with the new Dawn Dementia. Oh, I'm going to forget the last word. <laughs> it's New Dawn Dementia Understandings, <laughs> www.newdawndementia.com. And that's where I hang out. I can relate. So thank you for joining me today. Donna suggested that we talk about or talk on the topic of dementia needs are human needs. And that's not a topic we've had before. So thanks Mm -hmm. for suggesting it and coming on today. Well, thank you for having me. I always appreciate it. I always um, appreciate a chance to, um, you know, provide some guidance and, um, you know, the things that I suggest may work for some of the people all of the time or none of the people some of the time. So it, it really has to be keyed to what your um, loved one or your uh, resident, you know, if you're a caretaker at um, a structured community, it, it really does depend on a, their level of uh, dementia and also just the person themselves. So that is true. That's mm-hmm. how the podcast started. I was looking for ways to connect with my mom and all of the suggestions that I'd read didn't work. I don't know if it was me, her, just where she was at in the Alzheimer's, but I tried and I've learned a lot more since she passed, but which doesn't help her at all, but I try to share that information. So How did you come across the topic or decide on the topic, dementia needs are human needs? I mean, it should be obvious, but I have a feeling that it's not. (laughs) Well, so how I came upon it, actually, um, you know, this is something that there is a paradigm shift right now in dementia care that's sort of uh, drilling down maybe a little bit deeper as far as, you know, what we've always called, quote unquote, behaviors behaviors. He's a quote wanderer. Um, you know, she, she doesn't like to do activities and we label all these things behaviors and they're actually an outward expression of needs that aren't being met. And to answer your question, the way this topic came into my head was, you know, if you look back on this year of our, those of us without cognitive challenges. Um, If you look back on this year of the situations that we suddenly found ourselves in and some of our reactions to those situations, the underlying needs that spark what we, I'm going to call it a behavior in this podcast. I'm not crazy about the word. Um, Responsive reaction might be better, but for simplicity, we'll say behaviors. So what you see a lot of times that we label behaviors are actually an outward expression of frustration or disappointment. Um, To that example, I I did post um, an article on my blog last week with some of this subject matter. And I would like to ask people who, uh, you know, may be frustrated with um, the behaviors, the responsive reactions of, you know, maybe a loved one they're taking care of. I want you to think back to some of your own feelings with this pandemic. Because the underlying human needs are the same. So all of a sudden, about a year ago, we, some of us found ourselves under, um, you know, state guided uh, lockdowns. And so ask yourself for, you know, the person who's frustrated because maybe you have a wanderer in your community. Ask yourself when that lockdown occurred and maybe you were um, working from home or out of work, how many times did you kind of wander around your house looking for something to do, maybe finding nothing to do, or worse yet, you thought, hey, I've got a great home improvement project. I'm going to be home for the next three weeks. I'm just going to do this home improvement project. 
and you couldn't find the materials to do it. Or, okay, we're locked up here for the time being, um, and, you know, it's cold out. Side. I'm going to make a vegetable soup and bake some bread. And you went to the grocery store and guess what? They didn't have the ingredients you needed. I'll bet that brought about frustration. Mm-hmm. It brought about tremendous frustration. You're ready to just punch the walls or, you know, you, you had a feeling that you couldn't finish a task at hand. Maybe you started to paint a room. You went back. They couldn't get the shipment of, you know, the rest of what you needed. Ask yourself. I'm not here to preach. This is kind of a soul searching um, podcast. Ask yourself, how did you feel? Did you feel frustrated because you couldn't complete a task? Did you feel um, powerless or, you know, like you just wanted to kick a wall because you walked around your house? You done all the laundry you had, you could possibly do. Um, You know, probably most of us, if there was ever a time we were going to put our house on the market for sale, this would be a great time because it's clean and shiny and we've had. But the point that we need to get back to is that we all have triggers. We all have triggers um, in our daily lives. The difference between someone who is not facing cognitive impairment or cognitive challenges, and those of us, um, you know, who are working with people with those challenges, is that we may have the same triggers, but we don't all still have the filters to trigger that reaction, the forward thinking or the ability to reason to temper that reaction. So what happens if you're in, you and I are, you know, I don't know if I gave this example the last time I was on, but I know it happens a lot. You know, you're in line at the grocery store and all you want to do is pay for, you know, your quart of milk and, you know, loaf of bread and, and get home. And, you know, there's someone further down the checkout lane for 10 items or less who has done their shopping for three months forward, um, is now arguing with the manager because the machine won't take their coupons from 1986. And the whole line is backed up. I mean, do we feel happy about that? No. No. You start tippy tapping your little foot and maybe, you know, you have those reactions Do you walk up to the woman and scream at her, what is wrong with you? Or hit her? No, probably, hopefully not. Like, hopefully not. (laughs) Those are our filters. That's our instantaneous forward thinking. Boy, I would, you know, really just like to tell you what I'd like that lady to do with those coupons, but I'd get in trouble with it. So I'm not going to do it. That's our filter. That's our filter kicking in there. Um, you run into somebody that, you know, maybe you're not fond of. Do you stand there in the street and tell them exactly what you think about them? Probably not. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. But there again, the filters are the same. And if we felt trapped in our own homes at times during this pandemic or still feel trapped, Think about what does it feel like to live in a community with a keypad on the door? Yeah. I'm not saying the keypad's a bad thing. I understand that communities feel the need, you know, to keep people safe. But it's there. And we can deal with that frustration. Okay, I'm trapped in my house right now or that feeling of it. So a little forward thinking, ah, oh, picked up that Netflix subscription. You finally maybe started writing that novel that you started in 1972. And, you know, oh, we we reached deep to, to, to try and quell That's that true. frustration. Someone who has cognitive impairment doesn't have the forward thinking to say, okay, I've got this much time when I can't go here and I can't go there. Um, reasoning ability, what would be the best? It, it, it's not there because one of the things that dementia does, in addition to eliminating or erasing memories, 
is it also um, short circuits the ability to have that forward thinking and that reasoning? So when you see someone, uh, you know, what you want to try and do is drill down what is the underlying need that's prompting them to act out, to call out, to wander. You know, and we need to look further, I think, Jennifer, than just um, we as a society, not you and I or your very kind podcast listeners, but society in general. You know, again, with that paradigm, positive paradigm shift in dementia care, um, we always, you know, when I first became involved in nursing and dementia care, it was, well, see what they need. Do they need to go to the bathroom? Do they want a snack? Do they need a blanket? Do they want to go to bed? Okay, all very good things. Check, check that, check this, check that. What we're finally starting to realize, though, is that because these are human needs, we need to look further than that. Um, do they have a sense of purposefulness in their life? Do we need to feel purposeful? We've been, again, compare the two. We felt a little frustrated, to say the least, that we couldn't complete a task. Something simple as, you know, a dinner recipe. Couldn't get the ingredients. Yeah, been there enough times. <laughs> you know, couldn't find the paint. And we got frustrated with that. It's a sense of, I mean, not in our sense, maybe not as dramatic, but it's a sense of failure. I couldn't complete this task. What good am I? Yeah, you know? I did have some of those feelings during, well, we're still slightly in the pandemic. We're recording this today, January 7th. Oh, I think I'm in California <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that my beloved Michael's is closed again. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating because we're taking down the Christmas decorations and I need some hydrangea blossoms for a vase that I'm repurposing to mm -hmm. put where a four foot tree is. And it's like, okay, what the one thing I have found during this and this extremely long pandemic we've been living through is, you know, my family, my husband and I, our daughter and son in law, you know, everybody that's employed is still employed, everybody's still healthy. You know, we're, we're very blessed. So you you have this frustration of, well, I can't. I can't just pop over to Michael's and get whatever or just browse around and pick up whatever I want because they're closed. It's frustrating. And you browse online and that's not quite the same because, you know, you want to be able to see it, especially colors and things. So you think, well, OK, you know, this is temporary. You know, I'm blessed. You know, we could be out of work or struggling to put food on the table. So I'm not going to complain. And it got all the way into the end of November when the oldest dog passed away. That I looked at my husband and I said, I am out of coping techniques. My coping techniques aren't working anymore. Urgh. And it and it took a lot of self-restraint and acceptance to just be like, I know this is temporary. This is like, I hated it when people, when I was pregnant and people said, it's just temporary. I'm like, nine months is like, Wee. kind of not so temporary. I mean, it's kind of a long temporary. Well, we've kind of exceeded that now with the pandemic. So, you know, it. I could rationalize, we can have whatever food we want, almost. I'm still really frustrated I can't get my Ben & Jerry's frozen yogurt that I could get for years. I don't know what the heck happened. It's like, what the hell, people? It's just yogurt. Come on. It's like a little simple thing. But for the most part, I can eat whatever I want. You know, the house is warm or cool, depending on the time of year. I've got the dogs. You know, we're doing great. But, yeah, it's it's hard you cannot rationalize like that with somebody whose brain is broken. And that's right. one thing I've been telling people a lot lately is, yes, it's frustrating, but you're trying to make them understand just like you, when you try to rationalize with a two-year-old. Anybody that's done that knows that is just a stupid, futile thing to try and do. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't like comparisons to children, but that's how their brain works. So well, I, I like the way you're tying this into the pandemic because, man, that is really eye-opening. Well, and one one point kind of just an aside from the pandemic um, situation is that, 
you know, when you, you just said people don't like when you compare people with dementia to two-year-olds. I think that what, what we need to look at when we do that is the understanding that I know that you're not saying that someone who's 75 or 80 years old with dementia should be treated like a two-year-old. We know that's not correct because these people, God bless them, have lived productive lives. They've contributed to society um, and they're not babies. And the, But the thing that we tend to miss, maybe it's because we're worried about the politically correct implications of comparing someone with dementia to a toddler, but what we have, but the fact of it is, no, they're not toddlers. They're functioning adults who deserve to be reaping kindness and, you know, the security of their old age. However, if you look at, at it from a neuromuscular standpoint, if you have a two-year-old or you have a, you know, three toddler, whatever, they are also lacking in forward thinking skills have not been developed yet. Reasoning ability probably has not been developed yet. Um, you know, action reaction has not been properly thought out. It's developing. And you have a young child from a neuromuscular standpoint, they're going up that learning curve, all right? They're learning how to use a fork. Um, they're learning how to drink without, you know, spilling all over themselves. They're learning. Their learning curve is going up. Now you look at an older adult who has dementia through no fault of their own. One of the things that um, this underlying disease and the symptoms of dementia do is that they um, decimate the areas of the brain that store memories. And as the dementia progresses, their ability to reason through a situation uh, is diminished. Their forward thinking skills are diminished. From, you know, I say neuromuscular because their capability to maybe hold, maybe, Maybe not, but some who have difficulty, you know, picking up a cup and drinking it may need a lidded cup, maybe with handles. Um, I prefer to call it a lidded cup rather than a sippy cup. Um, and so what you have there is you've got, you know, a younger child from a neuromuscular standpoint and just development of cause, action and reaction. If I do this, this will happen. They're learning and their learning curve is going up this way, but you have this monster um, collection of syndromes that we call dementia, underlying diseases that produce dementia. And what that's doing is it's tanking those abilities. So their, you know, their abilities are, are going down, down, down through no fault of their own, while a younger child is they're coming down. The younger child is going up. And at some point, yeah, you know what? Those two dots are going to, uh, you know, cover each other, a crisscross on that graph. So I didn't mean to get quite so aside with that. But it, it's interesting to me because, you know, if you look at it from a standpoint of this is where this person is at. This disease has taken this from them. And maybe if you do look at it as, don't say child, how would I handle this situation with someone else who didn't have the ability to reason? I think, you know, it takes a lot of the frustration away of someone my age or your age looking at a parent and saying, what is wrong with you? <laughs> if we understand what is wrong with you is that, you know, this disease is kind of decimating you. I think people don't understand a lot, especially people who haven't lived or cared for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. They think it's just like forgetting short-term memory. Mm -hmm. 
They don't realize that the long-term memory gets all scrambled up. They forget how to eat. They, you know, they mm-hmm. forget how to use the bathroom and ugh, it's not pretty. And I think when people understand that, it makes it maybe a little easier to understand that it's, it's right. not just reminding them or putting mm-hmm. post-it notes on things or man, if that would work, that'd be great. <laughs> well, you know, so we talk a lot or I talk a lot about what's wrong with this picture. So how are some things or what are some things that we can do um, to maybe help them to relieve some of that frustration? So if you look at, let's take, for example, the, the person that just walks around the community all day long, that's all they do is walk. Well, number one, Maybe has anybody thought the fact that maybe this person just likes to walk? You have somebody who does not have cognitive impairment, who walks two miles a day. We say, wow, isn't that great? Look at him. He's 80 years old. He walks two miles a day. What a health conscious individual. That same person with dementia that logs two miles a day at a community, um, they're a wanderer. Why is that? Are we giving them the right amount of stimulation? You know, one of the big buzz buzz phrases is you can't overstimulate. We shouldn't overstimulate anybody. I mean, anybody's going to get a little, "Mm, that's enough. Um, So whether you have, whether you're a child, uh, an adult with or without dementia, no, overstimulation is everybody, you know, the human body wants to find balance. That, that's been around longer than, than we've been figuring these things out. So you need to find that balance of appropriate stimulation, appropriate activity, to which point, you know, again, because they're not children and they've lived lives, to me, it's human decency to say to them, what would you like to do today? Now, I know that's not possible in every community with every resident in every situation. But if you have someone who's maybe been getting a little aggressive, you know, they're a little bored or weepy, teary, ask them what they would like to do today rather than approach them with, you know, your pre-printed activity calendar And look, Joe, you know, we know you, you used to be, you used to work for the Department of Natural Resources. And today we're going to take a walk in the park because you like to do that. Well, maybe he doesn't feel like going to the park today. Did anybody ask Joe what he wants to do rather than present it? Give them, give them back a sense of control, you know, and we all know Keep the choices limited. I I don't dispute any of the very good literature and any of the good methodology that's that's come along, the good stuff. So, yes, I agree. Keep, you know, you're not just going to walk in there and say, hey, what do you want for dinner tonight? Yeah. (laughs) That's not going to work. But give them choices. Keep them feeling as if their, um, their opinions matter because they do. If you want to take care of somebody and make them happy, ask them what makes them happy. And yes, they may come up with some really, you know, off off the planet, off the wall things that they want to do. We as, you know, with our thinking skills and our professional experience, take that off the wall thing or in your our opinion that off the wall thing that they want to do today what can you extrapolate out of that that we can do with them that's a really good idea you know, i learned something i learned it. sorry <laughs> no go for it <laughs> i learned i think too late my mom in the last 10 months of her life was getting combative and one of the things when I look back, you know, of course, you look back with vision is 2020, which is better than my normal vision anyway. I would, we went to the, her neurologist who was, she was a fantastic doctor because she spent a lot of time with the patients, which meant she was always behind. So they would tell you to show up, you know, the appointment is at three, show up at 245 and you might get in at four. Well, my right. mom couldn't tolerate that. So I would just sit, check her in and we would go across the parking lot and get something to drink or maybe a snack or whatever, depending on the time of day. The last time we did that, 
I asked her, would you like a Diet Coke, which was normally her drink of preference, or iced tea? Oh, you have whatever you want. Okay, I'm going to have iced tea. Do you want Diet Coke or iced tea? And I, I, she uh, went around, you know, basically I got the circular answer that wasn't an answer. <clears throat> Don't worry about me. It's fine. You do whatever you need to do. Blah, 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 blah. And it was like, this is really frustrating. You can't even give me an A, B answer. So I stopped asking and I realized too late that if I had just said, do you want Diet Coke or iced tea? And she didn't give me an answer. And I obviously didn't, I did get her a drink is then if I had just presented, oh, here's the Diet Coke you asked for, or here's mm -hmm. the iced tea. Exactly. That might've been, oh, here you go. Exactly. You know, I wish I had been smart enough at, at the, in the moment to realize that even though she couldn't give me an answer, that if I acted as if she had given me an answer that might have helped her. I mean, she was fine that day, but I realized because she was getting combative and she wasn't, you'd give her, you know, yes, no question. And she would say, oh, don't worry about me. That was her favorite saying. Oh, so annoying. It's like, I'd love to not worry about you, honey, but that's not going to happen. And, you know, oh. It's like, so, even just thinking about it now is frustrating. <laughs> well, yes. And please don't beat yourself up too much. As you say, hindsight is twenty twenty. But let's, again, let's pull some positives out of that, Jen. You still went and took your mom and rather than try to have her sit in that waiting room, you had the heart and the kindness to say, let's go get something to drink. So she still had that outing. So I, I still give you kudo points for doing that. What I suggest to people, and, you know, again, so much of how we work with our dementia loved ones or our dementia clients in long-term care, it's, it's, you know, it has to be based on, on what level they're at. Um, when someone gets to a level where they can, it's difficult for them to even make a two choice uh, decision. Then, you know, if they can't decide between Millie, do you want the blue dress or the red dress today? Then go in there and hold up the red dress and for their dignity, at least say, this is very pretty. Is it okay if we put this on you today? That's Would you idea. like to wear this today? If they say no, then you take the blue one and say, oh, good thing I brought this one then. And keep it short. Okay, well, you don't want the red one. No battle here. There doesn't have to be a reason. It could be their favorite dress that they've worn every day for the last, you know, you, you had to sneak it out while they were sleeping to launder it. They love it so much. And one day, no, I've had enough of that one. Get it out of here. Okay, fine. So... What you want to do, again, my thoughts on when I wrote my blog post about dementia needs or human needs is we need to look deeper than just, do you need a sandwich? Do you need a toilet? Do you need a blanket? It's that feeling of dignity and their own self-respect that they can make choices. And, you know, I think if we look at behaviors come from frustration. You know, if if we are going to make a neuromuscular comparison to a younger, where the brain function is at with, say, a younger child who has not yet developed social forward thinking skills, why do they have meltdowns? They're frustrated. <laughs> they don't understand what's going on. They're frustrated or they're tired. And so when we have older adults that have dementia who've contributed to the world, yeah, maybe they're going to get depressed and they're going to act out if every day we go in and we say, we know what's better than you, what's best for you. <laughs> you know, we've kind of become in, in with all the goodness of heart and the best intentions We've kind of become helicopter caregivers. You know that phrase, helicopter yeah. parents? We've Thank become I never was one of those. <laughs> you know, make the environment as safe as possible and let them try things. You have, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to bite my tongue and not mention which major senior living provider this is. 
But there is one out there, a very big heavy hitter, who does not allow fresh flowers in their memory care unit. Now, no. you know what? Okay, some plants are poisonous. A lot of them aren't. Could you not do a little research and find out which ones? You know, sorry to have to tell you this, marigolds are edible. <laughs> That's true. So are I mean, you don't want to encourage that. But Somewhere in, you know, in the, that whole mix, there is that beautiful lady who ran a flower shop for 60 years who has, you know, plastic flowers in her apartment now. So we need to balance out that dignity aspect of it. It all gets down to a question of, you know, dignity, repetitive questions. That is probably, you know, when I do personal consultations and I, I, I kind of, do those um, with families supposedly by the hour. I'm not really a clock watcher, <laughs> but the reason that I think those are important is again, because dementia is not a one size fits all type of thing. And the personal consultation, uh, you know, if not from me, then, then find somebody else who will do one with you, especially if you have, you know, your loved one at home. Find out what makes them tick because frustration is even with repetitive questions, they might be information seeking and they truly don't have that compartment to store the answer you just gave them. So rather than ramp up your own frustration, I've answered this 10 times in the last 30 minutes, they're going to feel that. Mm -hmm. Okay. They don't understand that. Yes, they just asked the question and yes, you just answered it. They're not trying to drive you crazy. They just don't have the capacity to internalize that answer. So you can find methods again, depending on what level of dementia they're at, but whatever method you use to try and help them feel secure that they know the answer to that. Do it in a way that empowers them. What time is dinner? What time does Janie get home from school? Give them a little kitchen timer. Set the time. Dinner's going to be ready in 40 minutes. You set the time on that little, and you might want to avoid a buzzer that's like an <laughs> a little ding, ding, ding time. Set it. Give them the timer and say, mom, I'm, I'm doing 10 things right now. Please, could you help me with this? Could you do me a favor? When this, when you hear the chime, let me know dinner is ready or better yet, let them help you in the kitchen. You know, sweet lady or sweet gentleman. I know a lot of older gentlemen who love to cook young guys too, but I don't work with their dementia issues, <laughs> <That's> um, <good. laughs> but male, male or female that have liked to cook. And, you know, I hear sometimes from people, well, I, you know, my father-in-law lives with us and I just don't know what to do with him when it's time for me to cook dinner. Well, is he a potted plant that you need to find something to do with him? You need counter space. <laughs> I like let, that analogy. <laughs> let him help you. Instead of trying to keep him out of the kitchen, bring him into the kitchen. Somebody that has, you know, and, and yes, again, put your safety precautions in there. If there's boiling water on the stove for anybody, you don't have to have dementia. Make yeah. sure you put the pot on the back burner so it's not just, you know, things you can, you can do. If you take the same amount of energy that we all feel, I'm not putting myself above any of this. I put my name at the top of the list. My learning curve since I got involved with dementia care has been up and steep at times. So no, I am, I'm not saying I know everything what's wrong with you. I'm saying I've been in the thick of it. I've maybe figured a few things out that might help people. Bring that person into the kitchen. If they're asking you the same question over and over again, if your only last resort is to keep answering it until they're distracted with something else, then just answer the question. Don't get into, you just asked me that. I just told you that. Or, you know, your voice starts inching up and octave. 
because number one, that's going to frustrate them. Like, well, what's wrong with you? I just asked you a simple question. (laughs) And two, it's going to make them feel bad. Most people with dementia, unless they've got complete anosognosia, which is they've got blooming dementia, but no concept of the fact that something's wrong. That's not all common in dementia. Most people know there's something wrong here and they feel embarrassed and they feel ashamed. So that when they've asked you that same question over and over again, and you being a human being, snap at them or just refuse to answer it, it makes them feel bad. And what happens when you feel bad? You tend to retreat or you're going to start getting nasty yourself. Well, don't tell me, young lady, I raised you. You know, I used to hear that all the time. I raised you. I know you better than you know yourself. Well, probably, maybe. but you know, for right now, <laughs> we need to figure this out. I have a past guest who came to the realization quickly, but it was temporarily painful. Her husband was asking the same question over and over and over. And she, you know, after the sixth or seventh time, she sighed. I'm assuming the shoulders kind of slumped and she rolled her eyes. And when she looked back at him, he physically looked like she had slapped him. This is according to her. And she realized in that moment, you know, bless those people who the light bulb goes on a lot faster. She realized that if he could remember the answer, he wouldn't ask over and over. And if he didn't have Alzheimer's, he would be able to answer the, or remember the answer and not ask over and over. And so whenever she started feeling herself get frustrated because her husband was pretty sensitive to body language like my mom was, um, she would just breathe and remind herself if he could remember, he wouldn't ask. And that kind of helped give her the empathy and the compassion to, you know, really tamp down her frustrations, which kept things calm. She managed to keep him at home his, you know, until he passed away. And that's not always easy in, you know, advanced years. And especially if a woman's taking care of a man, you know, she did have help, but she was able to keep him at home. And I think some of it was because early on in his disease, she had this light bulb moment and she figured out some of what we're talking about. She kept him very busy, very regimented, but what within his, um, you know, his needs, you know, she, she discovered later on in his disease that just the fact of waking up and starting the day was exhausting. So she'd feed him breakfast in bed, give him his meds. He might take a little nap and then he'd get up and start his day. And, you know, that's hard for us to think about. It's like, you've been sleeping. Why do you need another nap? Well, and you know, uh, God bless her because it, it really is all about within the parameters of safety. It is their life. Mm -hmm. What do they want to do with their life? And so again, to try and, you know, stave off these behaviors before they become behaviors or responses. In addition to the basic human needs, people need to feel purposeful. And again, to compare dementia needs or human needs, when we were in this pandemic situation, whether it was an absence of a paycheck or an absence of a job, when you feel like you have no purpose in life or without the pandemic, you know, someone's fired or someone's laid off, you dip into, you know, you you feel like you have no purpose in life. It's kind of that empty nest syndrome, although I never had a problem with that I <laughs> whatsoever. I didn't either. So My I daughter moved. was 25 yes. when she moved out yeah. and I had thought she was, she'd been in college for five years. She graduated three months after graduation. She came down with Crohn's disease. So we had to deal with that. And it just, mm-hmm. it was a bumpy start to her adult life, but she's been on her own for four years. She's never boomeranged back, which was great because she moved out. My dad passed away. 
we put my mom in memory care. And so I was responsible for my mom. And I, there was one day I just looked at her and I said, you know what? Until I don't have to deal with your grandmother, don't be thinking you might be able to come home because one at a time. I only had one kid. So she was on her own. I was taking care of mom. It was like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only yeah. handle one at a time. <laughs> and it gave, I gave you a sense of purposefulness, didn't it? <laughs> so <laughs> it, was just, it was like, I, I knew what I could handle. Mm -hmm. I just let her know grandma's a priority right now, even though she didn't live with me, but it's, it's just like, you have to handle your own stuff. But I laugh because I had vis envisioned what our life would be like when the daughter was out of the house, which there was times I didn't think that was ever going to happen. And she moved out and my husband spent like two days. I swear he like erased every last evidence of her being there. Um, deep cleaned the room that they she had slept in you know her room and it wasn't long after that we did some stuff in my office and he had her room repainted i'm like i liked that color that she had picked i don't know why you're painting it whatever but it was just like he just went through this weird nesting because he couldn't understand it was like she's out not in the house anymore i'm like dude she was 25 give me a break shifting gears yeah parental shifting gears but yeah I'm like in, in actually doing that now i don't know your husband probably will never meet the the gentleman but um i i would look at that as his need to feel purposeful um oh, there was a gap there something was missing you need to fill that gap and feel purposeful. You need to feel needed. So, you know, I, I, a lot of the responses, the repetitive questions, or even aggression, frustration will do that. So, you know, let's look at those underlying needs rather than just, you know, whip out the Xanax and whip out the Ativan and um, there is a very good book out. I cannot re recall the author right now, Dementia Without Drugs. It's been around for a very long time. You know, and when we when I first heard that title years and years ago, I thought, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> but we learn. It's been my learning curve because someone who is pacing and someone whose agitation is ramping up. You know, a chemical restraint, which is what Xanax or, you know, Ativan, by definition, it's a chemical restraint. It's not solving the underlying issue that's causing the aggression or the agitation. It's not doing anything. All it's doing is, you know, you're pretty much slipping them a Mickey and <laughs> knocking them out, calming them down. Now, again, there are perhaps cases or not more than perhaps, there are cases where if it's like a frontal temporal lobe dementia where those aggressive behaviors are only going to spiral no matter what you try to do and they're going to hurt themselves, then maybe judiciously with, you know, a doctor's guidance, there's a place for it, perhaps. But Let's not start there. You know, we need to look at the human being, the life. I think these are just my opinions, Jennifer. So you can have somebody on next week that says Donna Marente doesn't know what she's talking about. And we'll have a robust discussion. This is how we move forward. So, you know, my feeling is that everybody has the older people. They may outwardly to an untrained eye seem to be behaving like a two-year-old, but look beyond that. What what are the similarities? Okay, two-year-olds are human beings as well as 80-year-olds. Human, again, human needs. You know, babies scream when they're hungry. Older people, dementia or not. I get pretty really, nasty when I'm hungry. <laughs> I was going to say that, you know, or or it's too hot or it's too cold or, you know, you got an itch on your back you just can't get to. There are so many reasons why people can act up. And these are the main thing that I would ask people to remember, please, is it's a question of dignity. Dementia to me, it's been said that dementia robs people of their dignity. Dementia is a collection of symptoms. It's a syndrome caused by an underlying disease. 
It's not smart enough to know how to go in and rob a bank of somebody's dignity. The loss of dignity, we've done a fine job of that all by ourselves. You know, if you think, not all of us, but the general collective thought over the past, you know, decade or, you know, 20, 30 years since we really start looking at this has been, again, with the most blessed of heart. We need to protect these people. We need to know they don't know what's best for themselves. Yes, we need to keep them safe. And yeah, some of it might be, you know, they don't know what's best for themselves. Maybe it's not a good idea to swap false teeth. And I've seen that happen <laughs> in communities. But you know what? They're perfectly happy. That's they true. They need to put their teeth in and they, oh, okay, these will work kind of a thing. So, yeah, we, you know. For hygiene's sake and keep an eye on that stuff. But the point is, we've become helicopter caregivers. Um, you know, the whole thing of um, Montessori dementia care is a, a brand new paradigm that Dr. Cameron Camp is, is just has some excellent, excellent um, writings and views is basically don't assume they can't focus on the strengths. You know, and, and in full-blown Montessori dementia communities, they plan their own meals with, with supervision. They cook their own meals. Oh, my God. Well, what happens if they cut themselves when they're peeling a carrot? Well, what happened if they cut themselves 40 years ago? <laughs> they yeah. put a Band-Aid on it and keep going. They are still human beings. So, um, you know, that's... The, the lack of dignity, I think, has come more from our well-intended efforts to say, nope, you can't do this. Nope, you can't do that. And everybody wants to feel that they have a purpose, um, that they're not a burden. So if we can all think back to some of our worst selves during this pandemic, you know, grabbing, grabbing that, that third bottle of disinfectant spray off the shelf when you knew it was the last one and there were two people behind you, you know, um, it's, it's, it's hoarding. It's the little old lady. We've become that little old lady that takes all the napkins and the silverware out of the dining room. So she makes sure that she has some tomorrow. Think about your feeling. I went into a grocery store and I, this was just about at where it was really starting to ramp up with the pandemic and the groceries. And I never, honest to God, went out with a doomsday shopping mentality that I need to buy everything in the store. Never did that. There was one day I was in the store. There was one box of whatever it was, Betty Crocker, chocolate cake mix on the shelf, and one can of frosting. Didn't matter to me that I hadn't baked a cake since 2006. I thought, I better get that. That's the last one. And so, you know, that's my need to feel secure. And so you have somebody maybe in a care community or even in a private home that see something and I better take that. I better stash it away. That's our mutually shared need to feel secure, um, to feel protected, you know, and just in general that have a sense of well-being for the future. That people with dementia also, they have feelings. This is what you and I know this and everybody listening to you right us right now knows this or they wouldn't be tuned in. They're trying. But <clears throat> for the ones that are maybe just entering the field or still, you know, uh, riding on those stereotypes and those stigmas, think about how, how do you feel? They're no different from you. They have what they're lacking is the ability to control their response. But the needs are are still the same. We're all people. They are really no different. So keep them safe, but we don't need to treat them like if you look at dementia as a disability rather than a disease, we've probably violated every covenant of the Americans with Disabilities Act for people with dementia. You know, what what have we done 
to assist them to continue to function in society. Not a whole heck of a lot. No, I'm I'm a big advocate that, and my husband used to be on our city's planning commission, and there's things, the way our na- suburban neighborhoods predominantly are laid out, it's not great for community. It's not great for age and aging America. You know, you've got your your starter neighborhoods, and then you know you keep moving up until like our old house was a mile up a hill before you even got to a main road. It was literally two point eight miles from the grocery store, so not really walkable, especially because the last mile was up a hill, like a steep hill, and you know, so you segregate people almost based on income. So that's not good. We were in a neighborhood in Colorado that it was a large neighborhood we were visiting. And on the outskirts, like close to the main road were condos. And you move in a block or two and there was townhomes and then small houses. And then you, they just kept getting bigger. So it was like everybody was in the same neighborhood just kind of depending on which street you're on, if you were in the executive, you know, McMansions, or if you were out close to the main road in the, you know, the first time home buyer condo. And I said, this is what we need, you know, everywhere. And we need to be, I read an article on how the suburbs are not great for aging Americans because we can't just walk everywhere, which because we moved a year ago and we moved close to downtown, it's, you know, Hopefully in 21, we're going to find our new forever home, our second forever home. And, you know, it was exciting because it's like, oh, we'll be able to walk to the park for music in the park and, you know, walk to the restaurants downtown. It was always going to be exciting. Yeah. Well, so much for that. (laughs) I'm not even sure we'll be able to do that before we actually relocate again. But, you know, I can walk to the grocery store. I can walk to the yogurt place since I can't get Ben and Jerry's at the grocery store. You know, it's like, it's a whole different atmosphere. Too close to my neighbors, kind of on a busy street, not fond of that, but it's really nice to be able to walk places. You know, not that I can't drive or ride my bike, but, you know, and the, um, I don't know what they call them, but those bumpy dots outside of stores to alert visually impaired people that they're about to enter into the street. Oh my God, those things freaked out my mother. I would do my best to try to walk her around them because she would get on, you know, whatever they call those, the braille dots that alert you to the side of the street is here. They're not, you know, you kind of lose your balance a little bit and it just freaked her out. Oh, it was awful. So it's like, we need to really start thinking about our communities, our cities, our suburbs, for an aging America and, you know, put assisted living communities near schools so that you're not segregating the elderly from the young people and maybe have a library close by so that they can walk to the library and the kids can walk to the library and you can have activities at the library for the seniors and the kids. And it's like, we really need a humongous, you know, revamp of city infrastructure, which you know, I'm in California. If it doesn't burn down, it might fall down from an earthquake. Knock on wood. I just hopefully didn't jinx ourselves. But oh, are, you in, are you in San Fran? I am 50 miles northeast of San Francisco. Okay. So um, there is a very big fault line that hasn't done anything for, I don't know, forever. You know, every so often you'll get what I call little earth burps. It's like, I think that was an earthquake. I think that was an earthquake. Okay, moving on. You know, it's not that big a deal. I even actually missed the Loma Prieta in '89. I was driving my car up the road, and all of a sudden, it was like, "Oh, we we'd been married a month." And I'm like, "Holy Toledo! I think I got a flat tire." And I'm like, "I better pull off the road because if I drive on it on the rim, then I'm going to have like an even bigger expense, and I probably can't afford a new tire. So I better so I pull in the gas station, check all the tires." Nothing's wrong with the tires. Get back in the car, drive a couple blocks, and the radio station goes out. I'm like, what the hell? This car is like two years old or three years old at the time. I'm like, what's going on? And I get home to our condo that we were renting. My husband, who is originally from Staten Island, pulled our, well, I'll back up a step because it's kind of a cute story. Our neighbor 
was on maternity leave. She opens her door and she goes, I think we had an earthquake. And I'm like, Ooh, we did. And like, I'm, you know, I'm from California, like earthquakes are like, whatever, you know, it's no big deal. My husband screeches into his parking spot, jumps out of the car. is like, oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay? Uh, 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 uh. And I'm like, what the hell? And he's like, we had an earthquake. Uh, uh. And he is like freaking out. I go in the house, nothing has happened. You know, like one little thing had fallen off the shelf. No problem. Look at the news. Bay Bridge broke the it was the Nimitz freeway when the freeway collapsed on top of itself you know god forbid the um not the super bowl the baseball game <laughs> oh shoot i'm not see i'm missing my yeah baseball. it was a world series world series out yeah <laughs> and yeah. it was between the oakland team and the san francisco team that was like had to evacuate out of there and it was like oh i guess this was a big earthquake <laughs> so i seriously missed the whole thing <laughs> Well, and you know, it's if you think about too, you know, actually, I will confess, I actually spent um, the early part of my life growing up on Staten Island. Okay. So um, your husband and I probably understand that um, freak out mode is kind of, you know, it's like, yeah, that's how we get up in the morning over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to be heard, shout louder than the next person. However, I've been in Michigan for many 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 years now so hopefully i've kind of calmed down a little bit from that initial you know um east coast uh, that just nervous energy i can't this, this is michigan we're just nice and folksy and calm down here um but if you think about it that initial sense of panic again human that initial sense of panic we were able to reason that out, you know, mm -hmm. to someone to someone with dementia, um, you know, the, uh, the, they're doing a fire alarm drill. Oh, that's not, mm -hmm. you know, so the needs are the same. It's just how do we, that's a perfect example you just gave, Jennifer. You knew, you were like, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm fine with this. I know what this is. Your husband, who was not accustomed to it, was like, oh, what is happening? So it, it's how... How we process stimu stimulation and stimuli and all that. And because we're able, again, forward thinking, rational thinking, to pull on our past experiences and say, well, yeah, it's a, you know, I felt a little, little tremor there. I know what this is and, and carry on. But again, it was that unknown situation, not just to your husband, but probably to a lot of people who've never experienced it, freak out. So it, in that human emotion doesn't go away if you have dementia and you see all the changes that these kind people have gone through with, you know, the, the social distancing and the way we could go on and on with the window visits. Yeah. It's going to ramp them up a little bit. So, again, sense of purposefulness is what we're all looking for. A uh, sense of security. How did we feel when, you know, we didn't know when is this freeze going to end? Are we going to get, you know, uh, small business loans to come and help us? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And it, those feelings inside of anxiety and exasperation, lucky for us, we knew how to deal with them, but we don't, <laughs> we always have to remember, um, the dignity is is one of the key elements of it. And whatever we do, and again, it's not to make fools out of people with dementia. You and I hear that a lot. Well, I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to make oh. you're not. <clears throat> if their reality is ABC, your reality and reality itself may be XYZ, but if their reality is ABC and you join them in that reality, you're not making a fool out of them. It's very comforting to them. And, and I think it's a little easier to maybe if you're in their reality, figure out what their needs are, what's triggering this response or this, this behavior. Why are they shouting right now? Because they feel like they're not being heard, like their opinions don't matter. And we all need to feel that way. I have a perfect example for being in their reality. After my dad passed away and I was visiting mom, memory care, 
Most of my listeners know that I would take her out to the park to watch kids or the pool or the library or wherever the kids congregated. That's where we went. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And she was always super concerned that her husband knew where we were going. And I'd be like, yes, mom, dad knows where we're going. Oh, you know, just like (laughs) roll my eyes. Like, yes, dad knows where we're going. And one day, I think she must have asked me that like five times in from her room to the car, which wasn't that far. By the time we got to the car, I was like, dear God, do I even want to do this? And all of a sudden it dawned on me, like I'm not answering her question. I'm saying, yeah, dad knows where we're at, but she think, and I didn't realize this part at the time. She thought I was her best friend. So when she asked, does my husband know where we're going? And I said, yeah, dad knows where we're going. I didn't answer the question. That didn't even make Mm -hmm. any sense. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult because I could never talk to my mom about my dad. And, you know, it's, that was hard. And especially not shortly after he passed away, it was like, oh, this is fun. I don't have anybody to reminisce about my dad with. But once I stopped answering her as the daughter, and yes, dad knows where we're at. And she'd be like, well, have you seen my husband? I'm like, sometimes (laughs) I'd be like, no, is he lost? (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, and then she'd say something sarcastic because that's kind of the relationship they had. Or she would say, ask, she was always asking me about him, which was really, it was a challenge to not feel my, my way about dad and just think about him as her husband. My favorite story, I was taking her to the dentist and she's, she was just, griping and moaning and rah, 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 all the way from the memory care to the dentist to the point where I was about ready to push her out the door. And she's like, you know, why is my husband not doing this? Rah, 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 and just, ugh, he was the biggest SOB because I was taking her to the dentist. And mm-hmm. it was difficult because it was like, if he wasn't dead, he would be taking you to the dentist. But I didn't say that to her because obviously that wouldn't have benefited the moment. And I, I said something like, Well, in in my, because I was frustrated, I said, you know, I'm just trying to help both of you. Is that okay? Well, yeah, but she's still griping about him. And then she looks at me and she goes, well, he is paying you, right? And I said, so far I haven't gotten paid. Am I supposed to be getting paid? And then she laughed and it was like, oh, thank God. We we have diffused that situation. And it was funny to me that she thought I should get paid. Her friend should get paid for taking her to the dentist. It was like- well, you know, it's it's um, one one way to to handle it, and you really do again for all of the tips and and um, advice that I can offer. Again, my favorite thing to tell people is nobody has the same set of fingerprints on this planet. So I'm not going to say that your husband with dementia is the same as her brother or her father with dementia, but that's interesting. Because she, your mom, it, what I'm hearing is that in that situation, your mom was being, a, she was asserting an opinion. My oh, yes. husband <laughs> should be doing this. Where the heck is he that, you know, my neighbor's sister has to take me to some, a non-relation has to take me to the dentist. Um, she was asserting herself in, in that situation rather than just, oh, I guess, you know, you're, you're the one, this is the way it has to be. So good for her. <laughs> one thing that I might've done with that. Um, and again, hindsight 2020, why isn't my husband taking me? Well, do, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I was just asked to take you to the dentist. Where do you, do, is he working today? Kind of give her, and even if she builds a narrative that's completely false, no, he had passed away. Obviously yeah. he's not working today. But even if they build a narrative that's not, you know, on reality plane for today, go with it. Well, why do you, I don't know. I don't know why he asked me. What do you think he, and there again, use your two choice things. Is he working today? Or maybe did he have some car trouble today? What do you think? And let them express themselves with that, you know, to to allow someone just to be who they are and not constantly remind them, no, you can't do that. No, you can't have fresh flowers in your room, which to me is, I love flowers and plants and, and outdoors. And 
to me, that just, uh, no, I would be, I would be the one climbing out the window. They'd be on the phone to my kids saying your mother climbed out the window to pick dandelions. Um, that, that would not fly for me. So, you know, we've taken away so much. I think the least that we as a society need to start doing now is giving them, them themselves back. The, the little point you mentioned about the braille bumps on the sidewalk hate those things. <laughs> That's true that. But even on the side of an elevator panel where there's Braille or we have closed captioning for, for the handy, hard of hearing, if that's politically correct, I apologize if it's not, hearing impaired. Um, we've got Braille. We've got closed captioning. We've got wheelchair ramps. We've got handicap accessible, you know, Department of Motor Vehicles. These are wonderful, wonderful things. I'm not saying we shouldn't have them, but where, again, where are the cognitive ramps? Yeah. That may be someone whose dementia is still at a point where with supervision, check-ins, they may be still be able to live in their own home, in their own neighborhood. Where are the cognitive ramps to help them walk down to the little bodega or the grocery store and do their own shopping? Or, you know, go to a luncheonette or go to a, a restaurant and instead of opening a restaurant and all you see are words, these, what are, what are these letters? I see black things. I don't see food. Have, you know, they, and I, I think it actually was in California. It was a dementia friendly restaurant and on the wall, they had these sumptuous pictures of their entrees <laughs> and they had a menu that mimicked it, a picture of well, what looks appetizing. These are all cognitive ramps that I think will, you know, again, with supervision help to restore dignity because we're, we're not so different. We really aren't. I've, I've been the one behind the lady in the grocery store. You know, I've probably been the lady in the grocery store with the coupons from 1986, you know, and, you know, I was sorry about that. Um, you know, so, yeah, we all have those reactions, but with dementia, they can't, it's not that they can't control their reaction. They don't have the tools to do that anymore. That's we need true. to give them the tools to do that. You know, somebody has physical aggression, you know, do some time with him as an activity, make a birdhouse, give him a hammer. I'm not saying give him a hammer and turn him loose in the community if he <laughs> has aggressive behavior. You know, here, Jack, go find something to do. Go find somebody to hit with this. <laughs> find a craft where, where you can sit with them and let them pound it out. Let them make a birdhouse. Then you hang it outside of his window. Look how productive you were. Look at how those lovely birds come in or whatever. You know, make a wood toy for a, a, a homeless shelter drive or something. Lots of things we can do besides just, you know, well, take a pill. There, unfortunately, these days, there is a pill for everything. And, you know, so that's that's my story. And I'm sticking to it, Jennifer. Um, if people want to know more, my website is www.newdawndementia.com. Um, I offer the required class for uh, credentialing as a certified dementia practitioner. And God bless you all. I would love to do some personal consultations and, and see if we can just make your last because sometimes it, it's until it's over, we don't realize these are our last days with the loved one. So that is true. And I get a happy time. Yeah. And I highly recommend getting some one on one with people mm -hmm. because, like with my mom, she was pro. At being able to push my buttons just like she was when I was a teenager or young adult, you know, when her mind was still fine, she had phrases she used and things she did that just, you know, it was just designed to just needle you. And it's, it's even now it's irritating thinking about it. And well, she's really good at doing that when her mind was not good. And you, so you can't rationalize with her and you're trying to mm -hmm. rationalize. But I found when you're an adult child caregiver, which I hate that phrase. They're really good at pushing your buttons. And I think the parent child dynamic makes it even harder to 
take a step, a big enough step backwards to go, oh yeah, you know, if I respond with, yeah, dad knows where we're going, she has no clue who I'm talking about. You know, sometimes it's easier for somebody to say, well, don't you see they're doing X? It's like, oh yeah, duh. <laughs> so one-on-one -on -one is really beneficial just to help, you know, because we're so close to the situation. Exactly. It's difficult to mm -hmm. be able to take a big enough step back to think about what do they need? What's, what are they trying to do? What fulfills them? What can they still do? And all these questions, you're just trying to keep them safe and get stuff done. You don't have time for this well, higher thinking. <laughs> to that, too, and I know where I'm probably taking up more more of your uh, airtime here, but the really important thing to to that point um, is that, you know, you, the interesting thing that you said, she knew how to push my buttons when I was a teenager, and she still knew how to push your buttons. So really, your mom was still your mom. Mm -hmm. Many reactions and, and in a positive sense, things that people, we can guide people with dementia at many levels of dementia, get away, if you're working with someone with dementia, get away from what we call, you know, rational thought memory. You have something, you have reflex memory, you know, the old saying, it's like riding a bicycle, mm -hmm. reflex, muscle memory. You also have something called intuitive memory or experiential memory, which means that not just your mom, but with intuitive or experiential memory, it's, it's what you, what you feel inside, what you kind of relate to. Oh, I know this pretty blonde lady and I need to tell her what to do because that's what I've always done. That doesn't take a lot of, it's, it's a reaction. My kids are all grown adults. As soon as they come into my house to visit me, I start driving them crazy, <laughs> and telling them everything that's in the refrigerator. Are you hungry? Eat this. I have this. Look in the pantry. I have that. They have told me over and over again, mom, we're adults. If we're hungry, we'll eat. But my, my in, instantaneous trigger reaction, and I probably, if I develop dementia, will probably still do it, is this is how it, it's my trigger. It's, it's kind of that intuitive memory where you're, you're kind of, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but it, it's, it's just, an, it's, it's always, always, always done it. Action. It's a reflex reaction. So again, in a positive sense, real quick, we can use those reflex reactions, those reflex memories and intuitive memories, you know, she was a florist. Just, you don't have to make a production out of it. Go for, go for a walk when the wildflowers are in bloom. And, and we don't even have to say anything. That intuitive memory, those, some things are just never going to change. Whether you have dementia or not, we as people, my fingerprints, your fingerprints, they're not changing. It's just how... <clears throat> people with dementia are living with dementia are able to maybe express their wants, their needs, their frustration, but you need to like, we again need to, me too. <laughs> me, me too. I'm still learning. You know, we need to drill down and say, why are they, why are they behaving this way? You know? Um, so hopefully that's, that's helpful. And, and again, dignity is so, so important if if there truly is an activity or something <clears throat> that they're they're really not safe doing just figure out a way around guide them around it and always make it their choice that well gee yeah like you say this this really might be better than present it as the lesser of two evils well if what they want to do is dangerous find something that's not so dangerous that that sounds better and then give them their choice. Well, okay, you know, we could go down to the pond where they captured that alligator <laughs> yesterday, but don't know what happened to his baby. We could go swim there. Or how about if we go out to the lake? Let, let's see if that pond extends around this, you know, and drive around till you come to something else. Turn it into a positive. And it's hard to do. God bless Every caregiver, 
whether you're an at-home caregiver or you work in a in a care community, usually for very low wages. Yeah. God bless them for for trying, for doing this. What I would like to see is, you know, try things for less stress on yourselves because it may take a little more time in the beginning. But in in the end of it all, um, you've restored their dignity, their feeling that they are being heard and that their needs are met. Needs aren't met. Things get ugly. <laughs> so the phrase comes to mind, you're restoring their dignity and your sanity. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. That makes because, sense. Um, you know, an interesting movie was on PBS. I don't know if you watched it. Elizabeth is missing with Glenn. I've heard Day. about it. So two things with that. One, I thought they did an excellent job, a heartrending job of presenting the what the daughter, the caregiver, was going through, what her life was, and and her breaking point. As with anything, when they portray someone with a dementia or Alzheimer's, I want to see a disclaimer in front before the movie starts saying, everybody is different. This is one portrayal so that people who watch this movie don't get the impression that everybody with dementia wears the same clothes, goes around digging up other people's gardens. And, you know, so, yeah, we just need to focus on the individual not not what we think they should be doing well this has been fantastic and i love how you had the light bulb moment of the pandemic and people's needs and tying that into needs for people that have dementia because this has well, really been enlightening i've had a good good chat today so if you, thank you for having me and for all of you out there, when you do feel a frustration, whether it's <clears throat> from the pandemic or, you know, you were on hold with the cable company for 40 minutes and got cut off, whatever your frustration is, think to yourself, what would this feel like if I did not have the tools to deal with this? How would I feel? So yeah, it reminds me of this. Story. Yeah, yeah that's been great. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. It's always a pleasure. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.